All right, guys, what's up? Welcome to another episode of Creatives on Business. My name is Henry Marsh, and it is my job to chat to all of the amazing people out there who have created a business around the things that make them tick. In front of me today, all the way from somewhere in Pretoria to a Zoom call, <laughs> is the manager of a little ad agency called Double Shift, which looks after the omni-channel marketing needs of its clients across a broad array of industries. Ever a sports lover, he has worked with some big brands before starting his own agency, including Nike, Solomon, Decathlon, Titans, and more. Away from work, he is an experienced public speaker and storyteller, husband, dog dad to two, bang average golfer, and an aspiring triathlete. Kurt, what is happening? Hey, dude. Thank like you so it. much for being on the show. No, it's my, it's my pleasure, bro. It really is my pleasure. I think a lot of people say, oh, yeah, it's my pleasure. This genuinely is my pleasure to chat. Yeah, I'm stoked. Um, you, are, you are based somewhere in Pretoria, right? I actually just made that up. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, no, no, no. In, in the east of Pretoria, in the bustling metropolis that is Pretoria. Yeah, man, that's, that's where I, I call it home here. Nice, nice, nice. Um, so, just before we started chatting, actually, I, I'd actually sort of asked you... Um, your, a little bit more of your background. So for the people out there who don't know who Kurt is, apart from this little bio that I've read, who is Kurt? And how do I say your surname? Is it Schroeder, right? Schroeder, yeah. Bang on. So, so yeah, Kurt Schroeder. Um, I am almost 30, which is exciting. Um, yeah, I, 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 it's difficult for me to sum up who I am. I think I'm, I'm probably a creative business marketer. Um, I love I love business and I love the creative arts and I've found a way to combine those things in like you said a little ad agency called Double Shift. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm not um, I don't know I still struggle to sort of sum myself up in these things. I think the thing that I really love do, doing is is helping people and their businesses to um, unlock real value and that's not just something that is cheesy and boardroom bingo, but to sit with people and to, to work out what they're really passionate about, what gets them going, um, and then find a way to monetize that and create an income stream out of that that isn't soul destroying um, so that they can actually do the things that they want to do while also having to do some things they don't want to. But um, yeah, sort of adding, adding business models to people's dreams, if that's one way of putting it. You, you haven't always been doing this, this side of the business, though. Right. You, you started, you started the, this marketing um, business ad agency of yours now quite recently, hey? Yeah. So um, I, I previously uh, was working, you know, in sports. So I worked for the Titans. I worked for a, a French sports retail company called Decathlon. Um, and uh, so, so creativity and, and advertising has always been something that I've been intrigued by. Um, and after having worked for, for Decathlon for a while, like I said, worked with a couple of big brands, um, I, I went and hunted for a job in, in advertising. I, I wanted to make that move before I got um, too long ahead in, in sort of the career trajectory. So um, I went looking for positions uh, that I could find in, in advertising agencies. Uh, I actually applied for a junior graphic design position at a company, not because I wanted to be a junior graphic designer, but because it was an opportunity for me to sit down with them and I pitched them a business idea. Um, and we, we actually started a, a the previous place where I was working, uh, an agency called Collabs, which was, um, yeah, basically something that I pitched in an ad, or pitched in an interview for a graphic design position because I had a great idea that I thought this agency should uh, jump onto, and that's that that worked. So it was cocky and ballsy, um, but that's how I got into advertising. So I was I was previously with Collabs, like I said, partnered with an ad agency called LKDA, not Al Qaeda, if you say it very fast. Um, but LKDA and I was there for a year um, when I decided to start my own agency which is now just just about a year ago. You mentioned just now briefly that you you were with the Titans and with a, a sports um, shop Decathlon. What was your role with them and how did you get there? So Titans, um, there's, there's sort of in the timeline of my life I, I lived in in France and China for a while doing my master's degree. So there's sort of before overseas and after. So, sorry, before France overseas, and China. I was at, yeah, yeah, so my, my master's program bounced me from Lyon uh, to Annecy, which is in the French Alps, to Shanghai and then home. It was a, it was a pretty roller coaster uh, master's degree. It was amazing. Um, but, but, you know, before I did that, I was at the Titans. And I ended up at the Titans because 
I'm a, I am a failed cricketer myself. I'd always dreamed of playing for the Titans. On my best day, I probably wouldn't have got into the, onto the, the water bench. Um, so I, I was fortunate in my honest degree to, to see an internship that they had at the Titans. Um, the internship was supposed to be 100 hours of work experience divided over a year. Um, man, by the end of my second week, I'd worked 100 hours already because I just loved being at the stadium. I loved, you know, it wasn't about being a teacher's pet. I was just soaking it all in. Man. Uh, seeing my heroes work, you know, working alongside some of those guys was amazing. And um, after that, they offered me a position as a, as a junior marketing guy because I didn't have a marketing department. And that's kind of where um, I transitioned from, from sport only to, to the creative side of life when I got into sports marketing at the Titans. So I was a sports marketer at the Titans for about 18 months until I, I moved to France um, and then left my position because I left the, the country. Um, and then after, after my studies in France, working with a couple of cool companies there, um, Decathlon is a French multinet. So they've got stores all around the world and they were starting up their retail stores in South Africa. And so the move, the, the plan was always to come home, um, after my, my studies. That's really what, what I wanted to do. And, and so a French company after st studying in France, uh, starting up in South Africa was the perfect transition. So I joined uh, Decathlon in 2016 as as uh, they call it a team leader they don't really have uh, bureaucratic structures which is great uh, so I joined as a team leader got to do all sorts of things from operations to marketing to to others um, and that's kind of how I got into decathlon and, and previously was with the Titans so what made you actually take that the plunge as, as you said earlier into into doing your own thing um, I realized it wasn't as hard as people tell you that it is, um, which is a ballsy thing for a, an entrepreneur to say. I'm not, I don't say that facetiously. Um, the arrangement that I struck, the partnership that we had at previously, right, at the previous agency where we started this, again, I guess a separate agency, but the idea was that we had a, um, it was a, a collaborative, which I got a discounted rate on their services. So, Everything from graphic design, web development, content creation, copywriters, tra -la, 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 la I got a discounted rate on their cost. And in exchange, I diverted all of my business to them. So they became my preferential supplier for all of those things. Um, so the benefit to me was low cost of services, um, having shared services as well. So being able to walk across the room, there's a web dev, and there's a graphic designer, and there's a creative director. You had all of those services on tap relatively at a reduced rate. And their benefit was they had a new channel of income. So it was a happy story um, until it wasn't. And, and there's just some boardroom politics uh, and, and, you know, things like that, which, which I disagreed with. And it was a good time, you know, from when we started it, uh, the understanding was that if at any point it doesn't work for them and it doesn't work for me, we shake hands, have a beer and go our separate ways. And we did that um, because I realized that it's, it's entirely possible to run that system with freelancers and to run that system with uh, independent, um, you know, professionals. It, it creates, there's a little bit more legwork because you don't walk across the room to the web dev. You have to maybe set up a meeting or set up a Skype call or something like that. But um, you also then don't have to pay for that office where you walk across the floor to go and speak to the web dev. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, double shift started with 500 Rand in the, in the business bank account because at the time my, my banker required that you open your account with 500 Rand. And so that's how much equity we put in. And by we, I mean me, um, the biggest thing that we, we needed and that we had was our first few clients, which was enough for me to have a very small salary to start. Um, but my salary from, I had a salary from month one um, because we had intent. We had, uh, you know, sort of signed letter of intent from, from one or three clients. So yeah, starting my own thing was largely because because it's possible with the way of working now um, and I could get in less money and still do almost as well because I had significantly less overheads than my previous mm. arrangement. Mm. Um, yeah. Speaking of, of overheads, you don't have, you don't have offices or anything like that. Hey? Mm. I did briefly um, before Corona, actually. Um, I said before Corona, like I'm speaking about the brand, but before the, the, the COVID-19 lockdown of 2020, um, I had actually just forayed out into, into a shared office space. So 
I double shift in this room that I'm in right now. I double shift ran for the first nine months out of this room, which is, as you can see, a sort of a, that's a couch over there and there's linen in this cupboard. Uh, and that's a champagne bottle chiller up there. Um, so all the essentials for uh, an office are here, but I, I ran double shift out of here for nine months. And then I took on a staff member. Um, I don't want staff working in my home with me. So I made the decision to rent at a really agreeable rate with uh, um, a friend who owns office space. I rented a space for a couple of months um, and then lockdown happened. And so I terminated that contract because we don't know how long it will be uh, until we return to that office. So we almost had offices. Um, but it's, you know, it's, a, it's an expense that I've, I find very difficult to justify unless you've got a team that must be in the same place working together. So have you, have you found it now, you know, you've got this team member working for you. Is he still working for you during this time period? So it's a, yeah, it, it's, it, it, it's a she and it was a she, um, no longer working for me. And, and man, I'd be happy to, to work lyrical on why not. So what happened was, was uh, this uh, stakeholder, um, Tried to take all my flippant steak, man. She, uh, not all my steak, I, I, I kid. So, so she, she wanted, she started developing her own similar business on the side, oh. which I very quickly found out about. Um, she set up a, an Instagram account and a Facebook page offering the same services as us at times using the same wording that was of our website. Um, and Instagram literally said, hey, this person is new to Instagram, check out their profile. And I checked it out and I was like, man, this person's literally copied, um, you know, stuff off our website. What the heck is going on? And then I looked at the contact details and it, and it was this uh, employee. So um, I, I fundamentally, I wish her well and I'm sure she's, she, she can make a success out of it. The reasons I hired her are exactly the reasons why she started her own business. She's, she's smart. She's talented. I think she's able to win, uh, win clients. Um, and what we understood was that she would be doing that for double shift. She obviously realized, and I can't fault her, like I realized previously in, in, my, in my previous work experience, it is possible to do it yourself. And, and so I wish her all of the best. I think that she could have, if she had made those intentions clear, I think we could have put on a better wicket to start her business. Mm -hmm. um, because, but it was, it was a little bit nefarious. So I had to uh, drop the proverbial ax on that working relationship. But um, yeah, man, it's not, I'm not anti-staff, hey? I definitely want to get more staff. She was a, a great prospect, which just you know, went a little bit sour, unfortunately. So yeah, working at home, I don't have to worry about another employee now. And, I've, and, I'm, and I'm, I think I'm also grateful because going into lockdown with that overhead, not being able to work together in the same office, which, you know, from a practical perspective, we wanted to just to get to understand how the other person works. I think hiring someone straight off the bat and then working remotely is very difficult because how do you get sort of the synergies and working processes together but yeah I mean going into lockdown now and there is a fair amount of financial obscurity for my clients and my clients are my bosses really because they pay the bills um you know, that was that would be an overhead that would be tough to still be paying now so down an office down an employee but not down on my luck for sure mm. Would you, you know, going into the future and, and potentially obviously still looking for an employee, would you do something differently in the hiring slash application process? This is a, this is a, yeah, there's a gem that I think I've learned out of this, which I would recommend to people who, who want to prospectively look at bringing on an employee. Um, the South African Labor Relations Act is hearty uh, and it is, it is, mm. Um, all for protecting the employee, and, and I'm happy with that. I think that it's very good, and that's, that's fantastic. Um, I, I feel that I made a mistake in, in what I did was I didn't offer a permanent contract with a probation period, which is a very, very good way to test out possible staff. Is according to the labor relations, you can have a three-month probation period, but during that probation period, in order for it to not automatically become a permanent contract, there are... Um, certain rigors that you have to go through. Um, so you have to do uh, you have to do feedback sessions at the end of every month. In a case that you don't want to permanently employ that person after the three month probation period, there's a couple of checks and balances that you have to complete in the probation period. If you feel that there is a part of their um, skill set that they are not achieving on, 
You have to give them training opportunities within that three month period. You have to identify it in a meeting. You have to give opportunities for training and improvement. If you don't see an improvement based off of offering training, you can then say, this is the reason for not making it permanent. But largely you are basically saying to someone, and this is my experience, and this might sound negative, but you're saying, listen, man, if you can fake it for three months, you've got yourself a permanent contract. Um, because people can, unfortunately, for three months, you can pull the proverbial wool over someone's eyes. I wish that you could have a 12 month probation period because I think it's very difficult to pretend for 12 months. So what I would have done differently, and, and I intend to do it differently in the future, as soon as you, so, oh, I didn't explain what I did. I offered a, a fixed term contract. I offered a fixed term employment contract for three months um, with, the indication, with the intention that, you know, after that I would be interested in signing a permanent employment contract but also for the protection on my side that for this three month fixed term period, if, if the overhead becomes too taxing or if I'm not satisfied with the work of the employee, that contract ends and there's no issue of having to prove why they can't go from probation to a permanent. Um, now I found out during the last month of that term, I found out that this individual was, was starting a competitive business to mine and that was directly in conflict of my contract signed with them. However, because it was a labor contract, I would have to go through a, a intensive and expensive um, legal process with disciplinaries, with a labor lawyer, um, with written and verbal warnings, recorded meetings, to actually get to the point where I can dismiss this person. And so my, the way that it played out was it would have been more expensive to go through that process from time and a money perspective than to just let them run down their contract. And so I did, I let her run down her contract I gave a busy work until the end of the term. And then, and then honestly, it, I didn't even, there was no even like, Hey, thanks at the end of it. I, I haven't sort of contacted her since two weeks to before the end of her contract. What I would do now, I would sign a three month um, agreement where they are an independent stakeholder and they are, I would sign an S a service level agreement, um, a three month service level agreement. I agree to pay you this much money for this many hours of services a month. Um, and the tax, the tax side of it is up to them to resolve. If they are trading as a sole proprietor or if they're trading as, uh, you know, whether they have a registered entity, I don't care. Tell me your company name. If your company name is your name and you're trading as a sole proprietor, great. Here's how much I'm paying you as a service level agreement. It's three months. You sort out your PAY and UIF because as the employer, I was doing that previously for this uh, stakeholder. Um, you must sort out your tax issues. I pay you an amount, invoice me every month for three months, happy days. If after that you are, you love the person and you want to bring them on a permanent contract, you've given them time to prove that you could make that a three or a six or a 12 month contract. But if they break contract in a service level agreement, they are an entity, not a, a person They're trading as a, as a company, not as an individual. Um, you, you can have a contract lawyer sign, write a letter, and that's game over today. It's over with immediate effect, depending on how you set up the contract. But you don't have to go through all of the labor, labor, labor issues. So not a, not a fun lesson to learn, but I mean, it's, I've gone into quite a lot of detail, but I would flip and recommend that for, for entrepreneurs who are not wanting to overextend or overexpose themselves uh, when making a first hire. Mm. Yeah. So I'm, I'm the kind of person who likes to dive quite deeply into the technical, um, but I'm just curious, did you, did you ever chat to like a, a qualified lawyer about any of this? Like what you've just discussed now, is any of this sort of based on proper law things? Yeah. So, so I, I do have a, a lawyer, right? So I had a lawyer who was advising me through the process okay. and, and we followed all of the, the legal processes that we needed to, from recorded meetings to, you know, printing contracts and blah, 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 blah. It was, it was a laborious thing. Um, but as to, as to how the structure of the contract goes when it comes to the, that new working agreement with an uh, independent contractor or with a, you know, that service level agreement in lieu of a labor contract, I mean, we haven't got there yet, but when it gets to that point, uh, certainly I would have a contract lawyer probably under the advisement of a labor lawyer uh, to write up that contract to ensure that, you know, the labor relations act is strong and I also don't want to go and commit to a contract that, you know, I find out later, Oh, no, no, you thought this would work well, but it didn't. So yeah. um, my, my lawyer, who's a contract lawyer advised that that would be a, a good way to go forward. 
Okay. Yeah. It's always just good when you, especially if you're giving such like a technical advice on, on business topics um, that are quite legal, uh, just good to have some kind of backing for that 100%. information as well. 100%. Um, 100%. I could just see someone listening to this podcast and be like, oh yeah, we're going to do exactly what Kurt told us to do. And then, you know, get fined a yeah. million rand at some point and then blame me. Yeah, don't do this. <laughs> get, yeah, get, get your lawyer to check. But, but what I would say, get your lawyer to check all your contracts. Yeah. Um, I think people, people are scared of paying lawyers and accountants. Um, don't be. Uh, they're qualified professionals for a reason. Yeah. Um, and I think that if you use them, you'll look after yourself much more than expose yourself. Yeah. So l- let me be clear. I'm not a lawyer and I'm not giving legal advice, nor is Henry. Um, we are, we're just uh, talking nonsense on Freedom Day. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I was, it was actually so interesting, you know, because of the lockdown and everything that's taking place at the moment. And I suppose me being a freelancer um, for the last four years, I, I don't realize when public holidays are. And it was, it was I only realized late last night that today is Freedom Day. Um, and I actually messaged you earlier this morning to be like, hey, are you, are you cool to, to chat on, on Freedom Day? Um, so it's cool that you're free on Freedom Day to chat. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Um, yeah, and I think my, dealing with freelancers, my, my, the funniest thing is for me is that many freelancers don't even consult a calendar. You give them a deadline and you'll say, cool, I need this due on this date. They'll look at the date and be like, cool, that's five days from now. There's no such thing as a business day yeah. or weekends or public holidays. There's... So there's, there's pros and cons to that. There's definitely pros and cons to that. Um, it's, been, it's been really interesting and funny to, to listen to a lot of my friends at the moment who are working, uh, you know, full nine to five jobs and stuff like that. And they, they're sort of like, oh my goodness, it's weekend. Like, because it, everyone's working from home, they don't even realize that, you know, it's a Saturday or a Sunday. And I was like, yeah, well, you know, welcome to, welcome to the freelance yeah, lifestyle. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny, man. Um, but I, want, I wanted to touch on, on what you were saying earlier about, you know, so so often people who go into business for themselves are so i don't want to say scared but you know everyone tries to take on too much and tries to do everything themselves but they're too too worried about taking on or don't think they've got the money to take on people like accountants and lawyers and and all these kinds of things but a large part of that also doesn't necessarily they're not full-time employees i mean i know from my side i i've always been of the opinion that if I don't know how to do something, I, I outsource it. Um, so even, you know, within the professional, my own yeah. professional realm, which is photography and videography, I don't do any of my own video editing. Um, I outsource that stuff. And, and I've, I've had an accountant and a lawyer since day one, but the thing is I only pay them per activity that they do for me. It's not someone I'm paying on a month to month basis. So I don't, again, I don't have the, the crazy overheads of what a, a massive business might have who employs someone like that on a full time level. But, you know, if I go and chat to my lawyer and, you know, need a, a contract drawn up for X, Y, Z, um, I pay them for that task. And it's the same with, with my accountants who, who take a look at my monthly statements and draw up, you know, my tax things for the tax year. Sure. See, I don't even know what tax things yeah. happen. I just, I pay someone to exactly. do it for me. Yeah. <clears throat> Man, uh, I, I, right, before this, right before this call, I literally wrote um, a testimonial for my accountant, right? So, so I'm going to punt him here as well. His name is Naomi Shekho. And... He is amazing. Um, he's got a, a, a new sort of startup accounting company. He was previously with another company, started his own thing, but um, it's called the Academic Club Accounting. And he is amazing because he knows all about my tax stuff and I don't really. Like I have a, I have a good overview to know that I'm not in a bad, on a bad wicket, but I trust that guy implicitly to, to be excellent at what he does. And the same with sort of legal counsel that I have as well. But what's great is exactly as you say, you don't you don't pay massive retainers to have these guys sit in you know your office all day. Um, it is based on you know a transactional activity based relationship, and that's it's good to have those people when you need them um, because they're expensive when you're desperate. Um, as soon as you become desperate to get a lawyer to write something now, you're gonna pay for that. Um, so yeah, good to have those networks. Good on you for having that set up from day one. Good man. Thanks, Kurt. Jeez. Yeah. Um, so we, we were actually also, there's, there's a few things that keep jumping through my mind that I want to chat about. So we are going to jump around backwards and forwards as I, as I think about things. Um, but we were chatting beforehand about how we met. And it was sort of like, you know, we, 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 we met just as I was going into the photography thing full time. And um, it sort of got me thinking about, you know, what was, what was really, really scary for me going full time into the photography. And I, from day one, you know, so I'm, I'm obviously a qualified engineer and from day one, I said to myself, I didn't want to live month to month 
um, you know, I wanted to make enough money um, and have enough money saved up that, you know, if there are three or four months that are dry, like what is currently taking place, um, I'm not stressing balls. What was, what was the biggest stress for you going into business for yourself? Yeah, so this will be, this will be very different from your experience. And that's probably why this podcast slash YouTube channel slash conversation is so good. So I have a wife, a full cream, like all terms and conditions considered wife. Uh, she is amazing. And she was both my biggest concern and biggest asset when I started my own business. Um, so my biggest concern was, you know, I have, I have a wife and a family to not, and, and I don't, you know, it's not the thing of like, oh, yeah, no, I've, I've got a supportive family. Um, my wife kicks ass and takes names and gets paid to do it. Um, so when I started my own business, I had the buffer of knowing that my wife was making a really good income that even if I had an awful month um, and the way that I've structured my business, it's, I don't like fluctuating months. So this is where I'm very different from freelancers. I like consistency and retainers and knowing what's coming in. But even if I had a tough time, if I lost a big client or lost a big retainer, my wife is making enough for us and we had enough in savings. We have enough in savings now for sure that we, we can look after not a rainy day, but a couple of rainy months. Mm -hmm. um, but my biggest fear was, was will I be able to bring money in to ensure that we maintain our lifestyle? Like we have bonds, uh, we have multiple, we have a bond on a house. Um, we have a car to pay off. We have dogs to feed. Um, and we are, you know, have, have savings that we're trying to make for um, a family home and for a family to put into that home, um, which will be ours, I hope. So I think the biggest fear for me was, was the security of my salary um, and not, not the same salary that I walked away from to start my own business, but something that would, from a month to month basis, at least cover the bills. Um, I... I think my wife backs me more than I back myself um, and, I, and I back myself pretty hard. I'm quite a confident uh, fella. I, was, I, I knew that with time, I would be able to get back to my previous salary. I knew it just needed time delivering quality service, um, getting referrals from customers who are satisfied to get back to the comfortable position we were in. And we were in a comfortable position before I started my own business. Um, but to... But that time is expensive if you don't have something coming in or a second salary in the home like we've had um, to look after your expenses and uh, ensure that you're still eating and paying the bond. Um, so, yeah, I think the biggest, the biggest thing for me was, was making sure that I was bringing in enough for my part that partnered with my wife's income that we looked after the bills and was still able to put stuff away. One of the biggest questions I always get asked is, how do I get new business? Now, obviously, you, you went into this sort of, you know, chatting to a few of your old, old clients, maybe, and, um, you know, taking your knowledge that you gained from doing something similar. But how have you gone about getting clients? Because I remember having a conversation with you, sort of just going into, into your business, and you, you'd already had like a couple of really, really good leads going for you. Yeah. Yeah, so... So there's a, um, an American author called John Acuff. And John Acuff has a book called Don't Quit Your Day Job or Don't Quit Your Dream Job. Don't quit your day job um, for your dream job um, with the idea that you need to work on your side hustle. And I'm not a big fan of the term side hustle, but you need to work on your dream job to the point that there's enough money coming in to that job to validate the jump, right? That you don't just go from your day job to your dream job overnight. Um, so I had, towards the end of, of my time at the previous company, I had to give, I had to give a very long notice period. Um, I'd agreed in my contract that there would be a, an extended notice period. And during that extended notice period, um, I was looking for other customers. I was looking how, for long, other how long was that, that notice period? Three months. Three months. Three months. So, so yeah, I had that time to transition out and to, to find customers. Um, so I went in with, I think I had three clients. Um, one of them was on a retainer. Um, and I had two other clients where there was work lined up. Like I think it was one client that needed a website. The other one needed someone to uh, design a company profile for them. But the, the, I say design a company profile. The thing for me, um, the way that I like to get business is to 
to understand my client really well uh, to the point that you are able to advise on what they need when they ask you for stuff. So that client who asked for a company profile did not need a company profile. Um, what they needed was, was to be able to communicate their services to their clients. Mm -hmm. So their idea was, let's print a company profile and send copies of that company profile to all of our clients. But their clients don't read company profiles. They don't receive a company profile and make that decision of, yes, this is a great company profile. Let me contact them. What they do is they browse for services online. Um, and so we needed to do something online for them. So um, all of that to say, I did have some customers ready who could pay me a bit of a salary from month one, but it was also a startup. So as much as possible, I needed to put money back into the business to ensure a partial salary in month three or month six, um, because outside of the one retainer, nothing was guaranteed. Um, it's, a, it's a different thing for me. I think it's, it's particularly funny because I'm in an advertising agency and I, the way that I get new business is not necessarily through like websites or mail campaigns or PPC or uh, content calendar plans. Um, because the, the nature of how I, the nature of my client relationship is, is exactly that. It's a relationship rather than a once-off transaction. Um, there is a lot more uh, trust. There is a lot more, um, I don't know what the word is. I guess trust is probably the word. There's a lot more trust that's required in our relationship because I essentially come on and as, as an advisor on how they're going to market their business now and in future. Um, it's not just a thing of, hey, can I have one of those and two of those and, you know, just, you know, no, actually, I don't need that. Thanks. Send me a, a quote. It's not like that. We've got to have strategy and consulting sessions and we have to plan 2021 and 2022 and yeah. where's the direction of the business going and how do we communicate that so it's a lot my client acquisition period takes a lot longer um, and it's heavily relational it's based on meetings um, and spending time together before we actually sign the first you know cost estimate that becomes an invoice it's not just something that you can do a lead gen ad on linkedin you know mm -hmm. Um, a little while ago, we were, we were actually at a mutual friend of ours' um, birthday party. And I chatted to you about this, this little podcast that I was putting together and the, and the chats that I've been planning on doing. And you mentioned something that stuck with me. Um, and it goes along the lines of we need more businessmen and not creatives. Um, mm -hmm. Can you touch on that? Yeah, so, so I mean, I did, a, I did a TED talk, I think it was in 2017, um, TEDx Pretoria. I did a TEDx talk, let me be clear, a TEDx talk. Um, and the, the, the subject of that talk was, uh, the arts doesn't need better artists, it needs better entrepreneurs. Um, and I believe that firmly still. I think, especially with freelancers, um, you know, freelancers and musicians and portrait painters and, 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 um, need to be business savvy. They need to understand that their, their art, or what they produce or their music is not just music or art or a production, it is a product or service. Um, it is consumed by a consumer uh, and it is hopefully paid for and so therefore it's a transaction. And so therefore you also have to understand how do I market it? How do I price it? Um, you know, do, do you have different price curves for different products and services? Are you as an artist able to define what your products and services are? So for me, I, I'm also, you know, a storyteller slash poet um, at times. Uh, I do that too. And, you know, when I do a performance or when I do a gig, there needs to be a way of defining what the cost is for that performance. If I write a commissioned poem, there's a cost for that. Um, and that comes down to how many words, what is the content, what is the due date, etc. But you've got to think of it as a product and service. And I think uh, a lot of creatives of producing exceptional work, um, but they're not reaching their audience, or they're not reaching their target market, their prospective consumer, so they're not making sales. Vincent van Gogh, incredible artist, um, someone else was a better business person, uh, which is why his stuff is selling now that he's dead. Um, there are, in that TED talk that I did, I referenced uh, De Antwerth, and I referenced um, Sugarman Rodriguez. And uh, Rodriguez, was in America not making any money off of his music 
um, borderline living on the streets at the time that his music in South Africa was at a cult level. Um, it, but that's because some guy had bootlegged his album from the States, sold it in South Africa, made a killing out of his music. Um, it was like a national anthem in the 90s in South Africa, and he had no idea that it was, it was being played or making money here. The opposite is true of the Antwerp. The Antwerp, you know, in South Africa, um, I think are maybe not appreciated uh, as much as they would hope to be. But in Scandinavia land, they are a huge deal. Um, they now own their own production company. They're not just a band, they're making money. Um, and the personas that they put on are very much crafted personas. Um, they are characters and they play the role of a character. So I would argue that, that yeah, Rodriguez is an example of an exceptional artist who was not very good at business. Um, and the Antwerps are an example of a, a subjectively good art, you know, couple of artists who I think are better entrepreneurs. Um, it's always interesting when, when, when someone brings up this kind of topic because I'd learned sort of really, really early on into my foray into photography full time that there were guys who, who were perceived as successful um, and, you know, from my point of view, who were doing really, really, really well and, and making money and getting all the jobs but their work wasn't necessarily as good as what you would think it should be. And then there were the guys out there who were creating work, which was just mind blowing. Like their photographs and, and the art and the things that they were creating was just incredible, but they were getting none of the work. And I, it, it, it really quickly showed me that it's not about the work that you're putting out, the work that you're creating, but it's about the work. It's about the business. It's about, you know, so many people often say it's not what you know, it's who you know, you know, and, and I, I really quickly learned, you know, about the networking aspect of, of, of business. Um, and I think it's a really important thing to note as well with, with any creative sphere is that, yes, there's a certain level that you need to achieve to be good at what you do. But surpassing that, you don't need to, you don't need to become a better photographer, musician, artist to make money. You actually need to start delving into the business side of things and actually start to incorporate um, certain business practices and actually just going out and chatting to people and putting yourself out there rather than just your work. Um, I recently watched a, a video. I, I, I've, been, I've had a lot of time to watch videos on YouTube. Um, I don't know why that would be, you know, but like we're going yeah, through some, some, worldwide, some worldwide pandemic. And yeah. the, I was watching this the worldwide video. The pandemic is called YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's this um, incredible commercial um, food photographer. Now he's not most, he's not the most incredibly talented human being or most even wo most wo well known kind of person. But he was he, he was putting out he's putting out this content which is really resonating with me. And, and something that he said was, um, ad agencies are not employing photographers for their ability to create work that looks like everybody else's um, even though so much of what ad agencies um, internationally require you to do is to create you know you, you need to rock up and create a look that looks exactly like what the ad agency wants it to look like but they're they're employing people for their own specific voice their own way of doing things um, you know it's like you, you look at someone's portfolio of work and it's like oh this is the guy who's photographing really cool old school um, candy bars these are his words um not necessarily the guy who's taking photographs that look like everybody else's but are just slightly better you know um so i also think currently i'm also busy reading seth godin's um purple cow book again and so much of what he is stated in that book is it's not it's not enough to just be better you you have to be different you know seeing a whole bunch of cows eventually becomes boring but if you all of a sudden see a purple cow you take note yeah and this, I think, you know, without, without um, blowing any hot air in your nether regions, but I think what I appreciate about you and what I appreciate about, you know, my buddy Ed Fenter as well is that um, you guys are now both professional photographers, but you didn't come out of professional photography school. Um, and I love that because when I was, when I was looking to, uh, at one stage, I was looking to recruit a graphic designer. Um, and when I was going through graphic design, CVs or portfolios, I literally could see per school and per year what the project was. Like the project brief was, 
design stuff for Standard Bank because every friggin' portfolio that I got from people in that year had some kind of Standard Bank markup. Um, and it, and at eventually, uh, you know, there were probably some exceptionally talented creatures in between there, but I was so not of looking at the same kind of similar portfolios or similar executions or similar techniques. Um, I, I get very concerned when creativity is too closely uh, coached or educated um, because then it, it tends to attenuate, right? It tends to become uh, conventional um, because there is an educator who has determined what that convention is. And that's fine. I think that there's a lot of value in learning um, things like, you know, the design principles uh, for a graphic designer. Um, and there are 101s that a photographer needs to know about uh, aperture and light and, 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 and whether or not you have to go to a very expensive college to learn that, that's a, that's a different conversation, um, which I'm equally passionate about. But I love, I love your example and Ed's example where it was your passion for, for the field that got you into it. Um, and you had very limited uh, outside stakeholders who were guiding what you learned and how you learned it and how you expressed your creativity, which is what already gives you an advantage in terms of being unique. Um, because you, you have not got a, uh, a, you know, a hard convention reference. So I definitely agree with the idea that, that being um, exceptional or being different in your field is valuable for the same way that in many, many industries, niche companies do incredibly well um, because they offer niche services. Um, food photography is the same. I mean, food photography gets granular. There's people who specialize in shooting breakfasts. It's a thing. Found out that that's a thing. It's a weird thing. But that's a thing. Um, and I think that if you know that, you know, you're a design agency, if, if you need a breakfast shot, there's like the guy or the girl, and there's only like two of them. Um, so I think that there's a lot of value in being drilling down and becoming a specialist in something. Um, myself in particular, though, I'm probably an example of someone who's taken more of the um, be a generalist at many things approach, mm. uh, because I think the, the speciality that I work on and that I feel I have um, is, is spending time face to face with clients and understanding um, what they need, even if what they need is not what they're saying. Um, and being able to manage those client relationships and unlocking, I say unlocking because it's a word that I use a lot, unlocking their need is what I'm good at. And then it's just a matter of directing that to the person who's great at executing it. So if they think they need A, but actually need, they need B, C, D, and E, I know who does B and C well. I know the guy who does D and I can find a guy who does E, but I facilitate the relationship. That's, that's my speciality mm. and ensuring that it's delivered you know, to the client in the way that they need it to be delivered. But yeah, being a specialist is great. Um, it's, it's funny how we've, how we've morphed into this topic um, because again, I'm not, I'm, I don't necessarily classify myself as someone who's a specialist. Um, and this is also a topic that we can, we can, or at least I can spend at least a couple of hours on, you know, having a debate between specialist and, and, and the specialist generalist, um, because I'm very much one of those kinds of people as well, where I'm not a, I'm not a wedding photographer. I'm not a, I'm not an event photographer. I'm not a fashion photographer. I'm not a corporate events photographer. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of very much in the realm as you, I, I have a relationship with a client and I deliver on what they need. And, yep. and, and I'd also like to believe that that's a specific skill set. Um, you know, I'm a, I, I'd, someone actually mentioned, it, it's funny, it's my old boss. I used to work in an engineering firm and, and him and I still um, grab a beer every now and then. And, and I tell it to him about this because I, I'm very much of the opinion as you are, you know, that there's, there's, a, there's a large value to be placed on people who can become specialists and niche artists um and, and I, I firmly believe that but at the same time you know i'm in this field of of specialist generalist and, and that's what he called me he said you know you're a specialist generalist um because i am the guy who, who people can call up to go photograph freaking four meter by four meter persian carpets um and i am the guy who can photograph the moon uh, what you know whatever i don't even know why i put up the moon right then but you know it's it's the kind of thing we can have a conversation between specialist and, and generalist specialist. Um, but I think at the end of the day, what it boils down to is just simply trying to be completely different um, in how you approach that. And then, as you were saying, having 
the relationship with people and building relationships with people. I think that's also extremely important. Yeah, I think I think that that's for me at least, and and I think you know that idea of I love that term of a specialist generalist because I know enough about all of this the the fields that we serve to be able to do it myself well, but not brilliantly. So um, from graphic design to web design to SEO and PPC, blah, 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 blah. I can do all of that, but I'd rather work with specialists in those fields. But to have an overview of that is a special skill to be able to understand a broad, a broad number of um, specialities, I guess, a broad number of, of, of work areas enough to see that when it's going wrong, it's going wrong, or when it's going right, it's going right, is also a skill to, be, to have that overview. So yeah, the, the, speci the speciality that I know I have is, is client relationship and, and spending time with clients and unlocking value for both of us, unlocking work for my business and unlocking results for them. That's what it comes down to. It's, that's what they expect from me and, and I expect them to pay me for it. So um, yeah, I like that term of a specialist generalist because you know, in, in big corporate, and I'm, I'm not a big fan of big corporate, um, I also don't want to necessarily see double shift as a corporate any day. Um, but the guys who get to the top, the guys and girls who get to the top, are people who know just enough about everything to be able to oversee and manage everything. Um, not just, you know, it's not, and, and I say this with respect, but it's not the um, niche specialist that often gets to the top of running a big company. Um, and that's why I say that is because the, the niche specialist probably doesn't want to. Um, they probably just want to be, they don't care about knowing what's happening with the you know, UIF claims for people now during this time. They just want to know when they're going to build their next website, when they, you know, what's the brief for the next application we have to design. Um, so yeah, especially generous, very cool term. It does sound like an engineer came up with it, I like it. So taking a complete left turn here, um, what do you believe? What, what, what ideology do you have that other people think is completely crazy? Oh, man. Oh, that's such a good question. That's a really good question. Um, yeah, I think, I think the... Um, and again, I, I blame guys like Ed and guys like you. I think the ideology that I hold is that education um, should be open source and that people should not have to go through uh, design college to be designers. Uh, they shouldn't have to go through. I think there are professions where there are exceptions. Again, I'm not giving legal advice. I'm quite worried about what I said about contracts earlier. Um, but, um, you know, the lawyers, lawyers need to go through due process to become lawyers. Doctors need to go through due process to become doctors. But I think particularly in, in areas of business, creativity, entrepreneurship, um, that there should be, there are already, and there should be more resources which empower um, those people to be you know to have the, the fundamentals of what they need to operate um, but also not attenuate their creativity where they look like everybody else uh, i also think that those those schools and colleges and you know none of them are my clients and i don't think i know anyone who owns or runs them but i mean to charge kids 60 70 000 rand a year to learn to become a graphic designer where I mean, frankly, graphic designers opening salaries are anything between seven and 11,000 rand per month, depending on how good they are. And good is entirely relative to mm. the bullish employer who determines their salary. I mean, that ROI is nuts. That is, that is stupid. Um, and then they get punished with things like student loans too, because I have to go to this school. That's the best, that's the best school. I love seeing stories like you and I love seeing stories like it um, of people who are not specifically qualified uh, or trained in their field of photography or, or creativity and then just going out and kicking ass. Um, I do highly value education though, in tertiary education. So I'm not, I'm not discrediting that at all. Um, you know, myself, I studied for seven years, man, and um, finishing with a master's degree was, was awesome. But I think that, you know, my first degree was in human physiology. It doesn't really serve me too much today, uh, except that I know that when I hurt my quadriceps, I know what the four muscles in the quadriceps are. Um, but it creates bandwidth. Like, I, you know, while I was studying, I was working two jobs uh, because I had to, to pay off my studies. And that was just a time where I was building capacity. I went from being 
like schoolboy who was worried about whether I was going to get into the cricket team um, or get into the attentions of a girl that I fancied uh, to you know being an adult and going yes you know actually life is quite tough and um, I have to pass these tests otherwise I don't do well and I have to deliver otherwise I don't get results and now it's called money um, so I think that education is incredibly valuable but I think that it should be freer than it is much less expensive because economies need qualified skilled people to make them grow um, yeah and, and I think that in certain fields there shouldn't be the hardcore curriculums that they have um, I'm not a big fan of, of design schools and art schools and music schools and 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 so maybe that's my left field ideology I don't know if it is uh, again like I say if people think that I'm ridiculous then they can phone it um, I don't care they can phone you um, but I love, I love Please seeing people move. Me. Yeah, no, don't. Um, also, for, for all your, your legal needs, uh, don't phone me. I am not a legal advisor. Let me just say that again. Maybe we can just call this podcast, Kurt is not a lawyer. <laughs> Kurt's not Kurt yeah, Darren. Think, Kurt's not a lawyer. Jeez. Yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, I think that's probably my left field thing is I, I'm not a big fan of, of private tertiary tuition that is outlandishly expensive. And I feel does do a little bit of damage in terms of creative attenuation in certain fields. Is that, um, I don't know if that's as wild as other people. Maybe people got on here and they're like, I think that Elvis is still alive. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I um, saw him last week at Poles. Yeah. You know, um, I was going to say that, but uh, clearly people think that that's crazy. So uh, I'm not going to say that now. Um, <laughs> no, so Kurt, yeah. Starting to wind down a little bit, uh, I try to try to keep these episodes under an hour, and, and we've just had like such a great chat. This is I, I yeah, really this love this 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 whole. What we're busy chatting about right now is is exactly what I want this podcast to be about. So I'm definitely going to have to have you on for another episode so we can continue. But starting awesome. to wind down, Kurt, if you could look back, um, you know, sort of to to 21 year old Kurt, what advice would you give yourself? I think specifically, and, and I've got this question before, uh, so I'm stoked to have an answer. Um, I would have told 21-year-old Kurt to study more. And that sounds crazy, having studied seven years. But I, I went through university for seven years, and I studied what they told me to study. Um, I, for too long in my life, and you and Ed, again, I'm, I mean, you'd swear that you guys are like my heroes or something, but... When you, when you made that transition, you had to study material that you knew would advance your career ambitions. You had to learn things based on realizing a need to learn skills rather than because it's part of the curriculum and you have to pass to get to the next year. Um, I think there's so much information out there that I missed out on and I wish that I'd, I'd studied smarter maybe or studied more of the things that I'm really passionate about. And I would say that even for people who are in university now, if you're doing an engineering degree now, but you're passionate about photography, I think you should be studying photography on the side. You should be learning, you should be consuming content, you should be practicing. Um, you should be shadowing people, if you can, for free uh, to learn from them. Um, but I think that my idea of learning was so fixed in the idea that, you know, pass your modules and then you're gonna get it, you know, you're gonna be super clever and get a job. Um, I just feel like I missed out. I wish that I'd, spent more time understanding that education is a privilege and not um, just a means to a job. So, yeah, I also, you know, just for me personally, I, I, love, uh, I love knowledge. Ooh, it sounds really nerdy, but uh, my, my, my dad once told me that, you know, you can lose everything in life but your education. Mm. And maybe, maybe later, if Alzheimer's ever happens, that, that could change. But education is such a... Um, a powerful thing to know, to be knowledgeable, to be skilled. Um, and I wish that I saw that as a privilege when I was 21 rather than a burden of something I have to do uh, to get a job. Yeah, and I would have studied a harder degree. Um, I, would have, I would have studied engineering, I kid you not. I think I went into physiology because I was scared of the workload that comes with engineering or comes with medicine. Uh, not because I felt I lacked the IQ. I think I was just lazy. Uh, I thought that it was too much work and you know, I'm sure that an easy little three-year bachelor's degree will get me a job, but didn't. Um, so, yeah, 21-year-old could work harder and appreciate education as a 
as an opportunity rather than a burden. Kurt, dude, thank you so much. Um, I've got two more questions for you um, before I let you go. Cool. Where can the party people on the interwebs find you online? Um, <laughs> so yeah, you can, my, my social handle is at Kurt Speaks. Um, I joke and say often that I think my wife would rename my handle to at Kurt Speaks too much, but uh, no, it's just at Kurt Speaks. Um, and then, yeah, I guess on Double Shift's channels as well. So Double Shift Creative, Double Shift .za, that's where I do work things. But otherwise, Kurt Speaks is where all the party animals can find me on the interwebs. People, people can DM you about legal advice. Oh, dude, I'm so <laughs> nervous <about> <laughs> Uh, no, but uh, just just to reiterate what what Kurt and I said earlier, like please please don't take anything that we've said as as proper legal legal advice. Please consult your your lawyers yeah. and your, like to, your tax practitioners. Exactly. I also like to clarify that I did everything according to the Labor Relations Act, <laughs> and you know, I promise I'm a good guy, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Okay, Kurt. Last question for you. Um, if you had a a billboard on the N1 actually not before, before the COVID-19 pandemic hit us. Um, so there was, you know, hundreds of thousands of people driving past there every single day. What would your billboard say? Um, yo, not live, laugh, love. Um, or what faith, hope, love. Uh, um, oh man, it's, it's a, it may be equally cheesy, but I'd say love thy neighbor. Hey, I think that, if we, if we love on people, if we look after the person next to us, um, we'd all be doing a lot better. So I'd say love thy neighbor, even if your neighbors suck, even if you live in a sectional title and the trustees are lame, love your neighbor. Awesome. I love it. Yeah. Kurt, thank you so much for joining the conversation. I really, really appreciate it. Shut dude. It's been fun. Yeah. Um, and for everyone out there who's been listening, who's been watching, thank you so much for joining in for another episode of Creators on Business. Check you guys next time.